far we could get. Because if we can get a little bit ahead, that would be good because of the other books we have coming up after um, Chronicles of Perdane. So, um, to pick up on 74 and 75 in which one is this? Black Cauldron. We left off with Taryn and Adion talking after uh, Taryn helps Eladir's horse and makes the comment to Eladir, bottom of page 74, Your honor is your own, uh, and so is your steed. What stone is in your shoe? Prince of Penlarku. Right? And top of 75, we see Adion tells... Terran, the black beast spurs Elidir cruelly. Terran replies, talks about glory, and we left off with Adion talking about the, uh, the passage right there in the middle of 75. Is there not glory enough in living the days given to us? You should know there is adventure in simply being among those we love and the things we love in beauty too. Okay. There is adventure in simply being among those we love and the things we love in beauty too. What does he mean by adventure? How can there be adventure in simply being around those we love? Because what do we usually think if we use the word adventure? What does it usually imply? If you go on an adventure, what does that mean? Trip, there's danger involved. There's risk involved. Okay? There is, sim there is adventure in simply being among those we love and the things we love. How is there danger involved there? You can get hurt. If you truly love that other person, whether it's romantic love, familial love, etc., what what is always involved in in love? Vulnerability, risk, possibility of being hurt. Okay. But then he tells Taryn, but I want to talk to you about something else. I have few possessions, for I count them of little importance. That is, I count possessions of little importance. Okay? Stuff. So, I have few possessions, for I count them, possessions, of little importance. But these few I treasure. That is, I don't count material things as being important. But these few things I have, these are important to me. These I treasure. So what are they? Luagor, however you pronounce that, his horse. That's the first thing. My packets of, heal of healing herbs, whatever kinds of herbs they are, these are things that he uses to help bring healing to people. And this, he said, touching the clasp at his throat. The brooch I wear, a precious gift from Arian Lynn, his betrothed, his fiance. Should any ill befall me, they're yours. If something happens to me, Taryn, oh, I don't know, while we're on our adventure, you get all this stuff. I have watched you closely, Taryn of Caradalbin. In all my journeys, I have met no one else to whom I would rather entrust them. Now, if you remember, earlier in the chapter, he talked about... Um, being involved in many battles, okay? Who has he obviously fought alongside with? Otherwise, he wouldn't have been invited to care at all. Prince Gwydion. So, he's fought alongside Gwydion. The implication is he has, if not fought alongside, he has at least been around Fluterflam, okay? He knows Dalbin some way. His father is Taliesin, the chief of the bards. 
And he says, of all the people I've met, you're the one that I would want to have these things. Not Gwydion. Not his father. Not the High King. Not Fluter. Not Dalvin. Terran. What is it about Terran that tells Adion you can trust these, these to him? Terran, don't speak of ill befallen you. We're companions and protect one another against dangers. Is Terran saying, nah, nothing's going to happen to you? No, it's not what he's saying. It's almost like he's saying, you know, don't, don't talk about bad stuff when we're getting ready to have, you know, dangers galore in front of us. We're companions and protect one another. I will protect you. Taryn seems to be saying here, if if I could walk out on a limb a little bit, well, if you die, I'm going to be dead too. Because I'm not going to let you die. I will fight to defend you. Besides, Adeon, your friendship is gift enough. I, I don't want your stuff, man. Nevertheless, we cannot know all the future holds. Will you accept them? That is, will you accept this gift before I die? He's not saying they're yours now. But will you agree, if I should die, to take them? He's kind of telling Taryn, I don't want them to fall into the wrong hands. I don't want somebody else to get them. Okay. So Adion says, or nods his head, and he feels better. Page 76. All right. Taryn wakes up. Sun is high in his eyes. The uh, sun was high in the sky. And he calls off for Eladir. And realizes Eladir is gone. With his horse, obviously. Fluter, good riddance to him. If we have any kind of luck at all, we may not see him again. For the first time, Terran saw deep alarm in Adion's face. We must overtake him quickly. Notice, Adion says not we must find him. When he says overtake him, that overtake him can have two meanings. One, we have to kind of get around him. That is, we have to beat him to the goal. What's the goal? Finding the Black Cauldron. The other meaning is we have to stop him. All right? Eladir's pride and ambition swallow him up. I fear to think what might happen should the cauldron come into his hands. His what? His pride and ambition swallow him. If he gets the cauldron, what is Adeon suggesting? What might Eladir do? Use it how? Raise his own army. What, what does Eladir have going for him, according to Dalbin? His name. That's it. But, if he can raise an army, he'll have a little bit more going for him. Alright? They keep talking. They move. They head out. Top of 77, Adion says, I don't know if we can... Overtake him. He's got at least a quarter's day journey ahead of us. That is six hours. Okay. They hear a sound. They think it's a bird. Adion says, nope, not a bird. The huntsmen have found us. We have to stand. We have to fight against them. We can't run from them any longer. Um. Skip a bit, go to bottom of 78. They have a battle. Terran says we're fighting uselessly. He runs to Adion's aid. And bottom of 78. Terran froze with horror. In front of him, he saw the snarling face with its crimson brand, arm uplifted to throw the blade. Suddenly, Luagor was between him and the huntsman. So, so Terran couldn't get to the huntsman. Adion rose in the saddle and swept down with his sword. In other words, it's not just the horse that gets between, right? Adion's riding the horse. Adion gets between the huntsman and 
Tarrant for what purpose? To save Tarrant. Now, if you do that kind of thing, what Adion is doing there, why do you do it? I mean, it's a sacrifice, right? But why? What is Adion demonstrating there to Terran and to us? About Terran, maybe. Okay. Act of heroism. What else? Why? Keep going. Cares about him. Why? What might Adion, by his actions, not by any words, but by his actions, be showing us? Keep going. Taryn's more important than he is. That is, if you're willing to sacrifice yourself for somebody else, you know, you're on the street, you see somebody, you know, beating up somebody else, you intervene, or you see somebody, you know, getting ready to kill somebody else, and you run in front of the person being ready to be killed, your action is saying what? Even if your mind isn't, my life is not as important as the person's life that I'm getting in front of. That's what Adion is saying. Or that's what Adion is demonstrating. Terran, for some unknown reason to us as of yet, is more important than Adion. Or, he has something to do. Adion rose in the saddle, swept down with his sword. As the huntsman toppled, the knife flew glittering through the air. He sweeps down with his sword, the huntsman throws a knife. The huntsman gets killed by Adion's sword, but what else happens? Adion gasped and dropped his weapon. He slumped over Luagor's mane, clutching the dagger in his breast. He kills the enemy, but dies at the same time. Chapter 9. They take Adion to safety. He doesn't die immediately. He says, put me down. I can't go any further. Page 80. They take him off his horse. Alon, we get some water. Um, they're in a clearing. And we're told, about a third of the way down. The wind howled above the trees, but the sheltered spot, by contrast, seemed warm. The driven clouds broke away. The sun turned the branches to gold. Adion raised himself. That is, he's on the ground, dying, and he kind of pushes himself up and takes a look around. His eyes scanned the glade. He nodded briefly. This is a good place. Good place for what? It's a good place to die. The ancient Greeks or Romans would say, today's a good day to die, when they would go off to battle. Kind of psyching themselves into the mentality of, there's nothing, nothing for me back there. Not literally, because yes, they had wives and families, etc., etc. So, Taryn, we'll heal your wound. You'll soon be comfortable, etc., etc. Adion, I'm comfortable enough. Pain is gone and it is pleasant here. Warm as spring. Why is the pain gone? Because he's nearly gone. All right? And then Taryn suddenly realizes, this is what you dreamed. But Taryn thought the dream was what? Just a dream and, oh, just a, a nice little clearing in the forest. Yeah, quite a bit like it. You knew. You knew there would be peril. Why did you not speak of it before? I would never have sought the marshes. We could have turned back. Now, when Terrence says, you knew, you knew there would be peril for you. What's he mean? Did it anyways. You did it anyways. Okay? 
He's saying that you saw. And yet, when Taryn leaves Kara Dalbin at the beginning, when they go off to find the Black Cauldron, does Taryn not know that there will be peril before them? Yes, he does. And yet he still goes. In the Book of Three, when they get separated, when Taryn and, and Gwydion get separated, and Taryn leads Fluter and Ilanwi, and then later on Dolly, etc., etc., does he not know that there will be peril? Yes, he does. And yet he, he doesn't even think about it. And so he's amazed when somebody else knows, knows, there will be peril, because Taryn hasn't had any dreams about himself dying. But he's amazed that somebody else would go on with it. I would never have sought the marshes. Notice Taryn saying there, if I had known you were going to die, I wouldn't have gone. And you wouldn't have followed me. We could have turned back. Adio. True. You're right. We could have. And that's why I didn't speak. What? Would he have some kind of death wish? Does he want to die? Does he not want to go back to his beloved in the far north, etc.? I have yearned to be again at the side of my beloved Ariadne, and my thoughts are with her now. Notice, her thoughts, but his body will never be. He'll never be with her again. But I, had I chosen to return, I would ever wonder whether my choice was made through wisdom or following the wishes of my own heart. That is, if I hadn't gone on, I would have wondered, did I not go on because I wanted what I wanted? That is, would my decision have been a selfish one or a wise one? He's obviously implying by not telling Taryn that was the wiser decision. I see this is as it must be and the destiny laid upon me. In Anglo-Saxon, which is the earliest form of the English language, Old English, in other words, spoken between roughly 500 and 1,000 A.D., and in Germanic languages before that, there's this word called weird. It's the word from which we get modern English weird. Like, that's weird, right? It often gets translated fate. But fate's not as good a translation. A, a good translation for weird is what will be, will be. Okay? That's what Adion has just said. This is as it must be. This is how things are supposed to be. I am not supposed to marry my sweetheart. I'm supposed to die here in the middle of nowhere. I am content to die here. Notice, not kicking and screaming, not railing against the unfairness of life. Content. You saved my life. Very good, Taryn. You're starting to open your eyes a little bit. You will not lose your own life for me. You saved my life. You will not lose your own life for me. What is Taryn really saying? Uh -uh, I'm not going to let you die. <laughs> Even though, for Adion, it's kind of like this is the greatest honor. He, that he could die for somebody else. Adion takes the clasp off his neck and says, take this. <clears throat> Guard it well. It is a small thing, but more valuable than you know. I, 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 no. <laughs> no, I must refuse. And yet, what, a day earlier? What did he agree to? Yes, I'll take it. But now he won't? Such would be the gift of a dying man. <laughs> no, 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 no. You're going to live, Adion. Why does Taryn, he's now said he's that essentially twice. You're not going to die, you're going to live. Why is he saying that? He doesn't want him to die. Why else? He doesn't want him to die because of him. He thinks it's quote unquote his fault because they took the path to the marshes. And because Adion died trying to save Taryn, why else? Probably. 
Has Karen seen a friend die yet? No. He's not experienced. How old is he? 12, 13? Maybe 14. He's not experienced death like this. Yeah, he's probably experienced death, death at Caradalbin with farm animals. He's probably had to slaughter a few chickens by now. Maybe a non-oracular pig or two. But not a human friend. Uh-uh, you're not gonna you're not gonna die. Take it. This is not my command, but the wish of one friend to another. Alan we comes, she has water. Adion's eyes had closed, his face was calm, his hand lay outstretched and open on the ground, and thus he died. Notice they stay there for a while. They bury him, they line a hollow grave with stones, they wrap him in his cloak, they put a mound of boulders over him, and top of 82, Taryn says to himself, Adion warned that I would grieve, and so I do thrice over. To burden with sorrow, to weary even to set a guard, they huddled in their cloaks and slept. Like his spirit, Terran's dreams were confused, filled with dismay and fear. In them he saw the mournful faces of the companions, the calm face of Adion. He saw Elidir seized by a black beast that sank its claws into him and gripped him until Elidir cried out in torment. Why does he see this image of Elidir? And why is it significant, or is it significant, that he sees Elidir cry out in torment. What's the cried out in torment part <clears throat> imply? How about maybe Taryn feeling a little bit of empathy for Elidir? Notice the black beast has its claws sunk into Elidir. It's not that Elidir is hugging, is holding on to the black beast. It's the black beast is holding on to him. And he cries out in torment. Why? If you cry out in torment, what does that mean? You're in pain. You're in pain. This isn't something you enjoy. This isn't something you want. Okay? <clears throat> Elidir doesn't want whatever this black beast is. The restless images give way to a vast sweep of meadow where Terran thought, where Terran ran through grass his shoulder high, <clears throat> desperately seeking a path he could not find. Overhead, a bird flutters, spread its wings. He follows the bird, and it leads him to a path. He saw to a turbulent stream with a great boulder in the midst of it. On the boulder lay Fluter's harp, which plays by itself. He keeps running in the stream, through a marsh, a bear, two wolves, etc., etc., he wakes up. Alonwi stirs, Gurgi whimpers, Taran bows his head, puts his face in his hands. Usually, if you do that, what's that mean? It's not bowing his head in prayer. He puts his face in his hands like this. Why? He's overcome. Sorrow, with fear, with frustration, with sadness. <clears throat> he dreams again. And, top of 83, Terran thinks, how could they hope to find the gold? What does that really mean? What the hell am I doing? I don't know where the cauldron is. And now we've lost Adion because of me. Terran doubted they would even be able to save their own lives. He rose, saddles the horses. He tells the others to get up. Before the huntsmen overtake us, Ailanwi, yeah, they're going to find us soon enough. They're probably as thick as a burdock between here and Kirkheider. What does she mean? They'll probably find us. They'll find us soon enough. Why bother? Why not just stay here and wait for them to catch us? 
We're going to the marshes, Taryn says. What? Taryn. When Arlonry says, there's no telling what Eladir has in mind. If you had made him jealous over a silly horse, I feel pity for Eladir. Bottom of page 83. Adion once told me he saw a black beast on Eladir's shoulders. Now I understand a little what he meant. She goes, well, I'm surprised to hear you say that, but it was kind-hearted of you to help Islamak the horse. I'm sure you meant well. That's encouraging in itself. It does make a person think there might be some hope for you after all. In other words, you not, might not just be a failure assistant pig keeper moron, you know, in the long run. Why? Because you wanted to do something good, Taryn. She's saying your motivation is in the right place. Even though your actions might, you know, be all messed up. Okay? So, they go on. And we're told, middle of the next page, 86. Taryn was aware, strangely, of vast activities along the forest trail. Squirrels prepared the winter hoard. Ants labored in the earthen castles. He could see them. Not so much with his eyes, but in a way he'd never known before. That is, they're walking along this trail, horseback, and he doesn't literally see ants building their mounds, but he's aware of them. He's aware of squirrels out in the forest, storing their food for winter. The air itself bore special scents. There was a ripple, sharp and clear like cold wine. Tara knew, without stopping to think, a north wind had just begun to rise. In the middle of this, he noticed another scent. He turned towards it. She goes, uh, Arlandri, do you want to tell us where you're going? Water nearby. We need to fill our flask. Yep, yep, there's a stream. I'm sure of it. And they go, and on a rock in the middle of the stream, sat Fluter, cooling his bare feet in the water. What did Taryn dream about the night before? It's hard. Fluter, I, I don't know what happened. We were galloping top speed, blah, 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 blah. Okay. So, he's now had a dream, and that dream what? Happened. Page 86. Taryn gives Melon Loss rain, that is, let the horse do what the horse wants to do. The trees thinned out. He dozes. He sees the meadow grass high around them. They hear a bird. Terrence says it's a marsh bird. Right? And they find a path. Terrence, bottom of that page. This is not my doing. Adion spoke the truth. His gift is a precious one. Taryn realizes the clasp that he's wearing around his neck. That's what's enabling him to notice the smell of water, to notice the smell of a new wind rising, to notice what is happening among all the animal creatures of the forest. Don't you see? I dreamed about Fluter's heart, and we found Fluter. It wasn't on my own idea to go looking for a stream. It just came to me. I knew we would find it. And just now when I saw the bird, that was in my dream. There was another. <gasps> Here's part of the other dream. A bear, wolves. That's going to happen too. Adion's dreams were always true. She says, Adion was a wonderful man, Terry. You can't tell me it was all because of a piece of iron. I don't care how magical it is. That is, a piece of stuff isn't what makes a person magical. He goes, no, 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 no. You don't get it. What I believe is that Adion understood these things anyway. Even with this clasp, there is much I do not understand. He's saying, the clasp is kind of like a new set of lenses for me. Think Tolkien's idea of recovery. Okay, Adion knew all that without the clasp. Part of that is because it's part of the training of the bards. To kind of become one with nature to understand the language of the trees and the birds and you know, all that kind of stuff. All I know is that I feel differently somehow. I can see things I never saw before or smell or taste them. We would say he has heightened senses. You know, 
His sense of smell has just been refined. His sense of hearing has just been refined. If the other's hearing and smell had been more refined, they would have heard the change in the wind. They would have smelled clear water, etc. I can't say exactly what it is. It's strange, awesome, very beautiful. There are things that I know, and I don't even know how I know them. Arlongwe, I get it now. You don't sound like yourself. In other words, that's not an assistant pig keeper talking anymore. Adion's clasp is a priceless gift. So if it's priceless, what does that mean? If something is described as priceless, it what? There's no value that can be attached to it. <clears throat> that is, it can't be bought and sold. There's not enough money in the world for it. It gives you a kind of wisdom, which I suppose is what assistant pig keepers need more than anything else. Just, you know, slam! <laughs> Just about every time Alonwe praises them, it's kind of, you know, damning with faint praise. Give them a little bit of praise, but she undercuts it. Okay? It's not because she means to do that, however. So, Marshes of Morva. Um, Taryn shows Fluter, the clasp, page 90. And Fluter says, oh, I know that. That's the bardic symbol. I know the bardic symbol well. It's secret, though, since you have the clasp, I don't suppose it can do any harm for me to tell you. The lines mean knowledge, truth, and love. Back up for a second. Yeah, three lines like an arrowhead, top, uh, bottom of 89. <clears throat> okay, so the lines on the clasp, the symbol on the clasp, mean knowledge, truth, and love. Well, that's, you know, that's nice, but why knowledge, truth, and love should be such a secret? Really, what's so secretive about knowledge, truth, and love? Fluter. Well, maybe I shouldn't say secret, but unusual. I sometimes think it's hard enough to find any one of them even separate. Knowledge, truth, love. Notice this symbol, the clasp, kind of encapsulates all three. What did Fluter just say? I sometimes think it's hard enough to find any one of them separately. I think it's hard enough just to find knowledge. I think it's hard enough just to find truth. What's the difference between knowledge and truth? Knowledge is like information. So what's truth then? The application of knowledge? Wisdom? Love. What does love have to do with knowledge or truth? Put them all together and you have something very powerful indeed. Okay? They walk, the slope they're on collapses, Page 91. All right. It's raining. They're kind of miserable. And Taryn tells the dreams that he has to Ilanri. I saw Elodir, bottom of 91. I saw Elodir in mortal danger. At the same time, uh, lost my place. it was as though my hands were bound and I could not help him. Okay. Ilanri. The only place you're going to see Eladir is in your dreams. Why? Because he's dead? Why else? What's another possibility? We're lost. We're never going to catch him. We're never going to find him. He's going to get to Black Cauldron. We're on a wild goose chase. You're not leading us properly. How much hope does she have? None. There certainly hasn't been a trace of him. That is, it's not like we're following his footsteps, we're following his tracks. 
For all we know, he could have been the Morvan God. Maybe he didn't even reach the marshes. Too bad you didn't dream of an easier way to find the cauldron. Come on, Taryn. Have a good dream. Find the cauldron. Kind of like, if you're familiar with the Harry Potter stories, when, I think it's in the fifth book, um, it is in the fifth book, Dolores Jane Umbridge tells Professor Trelawney, uh, give me a prophecy right now. Come on. Give me a prediction. Tell me something. Because Trelawney is the, the uh, what do you call her, fortune teller professor, the divination professor. She can see into the future. And she's like, well, it, it, it doesn't work like that. It's not like a light switch I can turn on and off. Even though she does seemingly like a light switch, turn on and off. Taryn, I dreamed of the cauldron too. He said anxiously. But everything was confused and clouded. See, well, that's the problem with dreams, right? Confused. It, it, it wasn't clear. Okay. There's huntsmen about. Taryn tells them what they're going to do. He gives the signal. They follow his lead. Page 94. Let's see here. Bottom of 94. They get to the other side of the marshes. They find a cottage. They look around. And Alondwe says, uh, it should be Fluter says, I don't think anyone's been here for quite some time. The chamber, Terran saw, indeed seemed deserted of inhabitants at least, for the room was even more heaped up and disorderly than Dolvin's. In one corner stands Bloom, with a good many of the threads straggling down. The work on the frame was less than half finished, and so tangled and knotted he could imagine no one ever continuing it. Broken crockery covered a small table, rusted and broken weapons all around. And a voice says, how would you like it if you were turned into a toad and stepped on? And we get chapter 11, the cottage. Taryn turns around, ready to kill. He sees a serpent. Serpent falls, uh, excuse me, with his sword. His sword turns into a serpent. And facing him is a short, rather plump little woman. She talks to them. Let's skip a bit. Pick up with 96. Who are you? Taryn asks. We've done you no harm. You have no cause to threaten us. The Enchantress. So our narrator is telling us something about this individual. How do we know the individual is an Enchantress? Yeah, his sword just turned into a snake. That's not normal. How many twigs in a bird's nest? What? Come on, answer. You don't even know. How could you be expected to know what you really want out of life? If you can't tell me how many twigs are in a bird's nest, how do you really know what it is you want out of Terrence like, What the hell kind of question is that? What do you mean? I don't want to be a toad, okay? I don't know what else I want in life. I don't want to be a toad. If I can just... Well, you're a pretty little duck. Would you give me your hair once you're done with it? What? Okay. So they keep talking, and she talks strangely to them. Says, you know, can't have people, people poking, prying about, etc., etc. Taryn talks about or they talk about the cauldron, page 97. The Enchantress runs out to the other women, and we hear Orwin, Orgok, and Taryn's like, I remember those names. Call said those names. Skipping a little bit, bottom of 98. 
or do Orwin or Gok talking back and forth to each other. And at the bottom of 98, Orwin says, why, those are the ones we saw galloping across the marsh. It was so clever of you, she says to Taryn, to have the huntsman swallowed up in the bog. Really, quite well done. Well, how did they see that? Were they hovering above? Disgusting creatures, nasty, hairy, vicious things. They keep talking back and forth. And Taryn, finally, says, um, let's see, page 101, they start to give, Taryn starts to give the three women, we'll call them temporarily, um, their names, but he doesn't give them their real names. Uh, this, he points to our laundry, this is uh, Indeg and Prince, well, if they're not going to tell us their true names, so Taryn finally says, I'm Taryn, assistant pig keeper of Kira Dalvin. How is dear little Dalvin? Orgu says. Now describe Dalvin. How old? Older than dirt. Older than dirt, yeah. Really, really old. Is he little? No. He's actually pretty good sized. Well, why didn't you tell us in the first place? Tara's like, he's speaking English and they're speaking, you know, Urdu or something. So, next chapter, Little Dolphin. Tara, I've never heard anybody call him that before. <laughs> you know, can you imagine somebody going up and saying, oh, Little Dolphin? That would be like, you know, going up to somebody of great power and importance and calling them, you know, Little Donnie Trump or something, you know, like that. Okay. So, they continue talking. I'm going to skip a bunch. And page 103, Ordu says, you got to tell us about Dalvin. What's he doing? Still have the book of three? Taryn, yeah, he does. Okay. Um, Taryn says he's old, elderly, 380 years old. Call told me, well, you're such a dear, sweet little thing. Oh, pink cheeks and chubby fingers. Okay, pink cheeks and chubby fingers means when? When he was a baby. So what does that tell us about these three? They're obviously older than Dalvin. Maybe they're 400. Okay. But it's going to be implied. They're much older than that. Okay. Okay. So, they talk about Dalbin 104. We found him in the marsh one morning. All by himself in a great whisk, wicker basket. Kind of like... What famous person from, let's say, Jewish myth was found in a wicker basket in a body of water? Moses. So they keep talking. Dobbin, you know, was stirring the kettle. One of those kind, thoughtful things he did. It came to a boil. Some of it bubbled up, splashed out, burned his fingers. He didn't cry. No, nope. popped his finger into his mouth. Some of the potion was there. He swallowed it. As soon as he did that, he knew every bit as much as we did. But it was a magical brew and meant recipe for wisdom. After that, we couldn't keep him here. We gave him his choice, middle of 105, of a harp, a sword, or the book of three. Okay? He could have a harp, he could become a bard, he could become a singer. He could have a sword, he could become a hero, he could become powerful, or the book of three. Had he chosen the harp, greatest bard in the world. The sword, who would have ruled all per day. No, he wanted the book of three. It was heavy, moldy, gathered dust. We didn't need it anymore, so he left the world, etc., etc. Okay? So Terrence says, help me help Dalvin. Okay? Bottom of 107. They talk about the Black Cauldron. They talk about Iran. 
Even Iran had to be allowed to have his chance. One day you'll understand why, for there's a destiny laid on everything. That is, everything must become what it is supposed to become or do. On big, ugly Cochran's as well, Crokins as well as poor little ducklings, destiny laid even on us. In any case, the Crokin was not to be his forever. Iran swore to return it after a time. When the time came, he broke his oath as might be expected. In other words, we knew he was going to break his oath. And since he wouldn't give it back, what else could we do? We took it. Terrence thinking, how do these fat, dumpy old ladies go take it from Iran? <laughs> Fluter, you three ladies ventured into the heart of a new and carried the thing. How? Well, there's, we could have flooded it. We could have put all the guards to sleep, or we could have turned ourselves into, well, it doesn't matter, but, but just, we did it. Okay? So, they tell them, no, you can't have it, but you can sleep in the shed tonight. And the three come up with a plan. Three, Taryn, Fluter, Tommy. Yeah, come up with a plan to steal it. Ilanri, page 111, says, I don't trust those enchantresses. They wouldn't sleep if they thought we had the cauldron. Okay. Bottom of 112. Taryn's thinking, we got to get back into the cottage. But how? Hattie owns class was giving me no idea. The dreams I had, they're without meaning. I can if I could only understand them, okay? Skip a bit. 114. Terrence says, they, they sneak inside the cottage. It is the Black Cauldron. Fluter's face was pale. I long we put a hand to her mouth. Gurgi shivered pitifully, though he himself had found it. It's actually in the shed where they are. I long we. It's full of death and suffering. I understand why Gwydion wants to destroy it. That is, just by being near it, she can sense there is nothing good about this. Okay? You were right in seeking it without delay, she tells Taryn. Now, until they discover the Black Cauldron, what does she tell Taryn about his trying to find it? Pointless. Pointless. It's wrong. We should tell Gwydion, blah, 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 blah. I take back all the things I said. The croaking must be destroyed as soon as possible. Fluter, yep, you're right. Okay. So, they try to move it. It's too heavy. Bottom 115. Taryn says, maybe they meant for us to find it. So, they try to sleep, but they can't. 116. Terrence says, I saw them. He snuck back to the cottage. They aren't the same ones at all. I'm like, what? Sure, you didn't go to a different cottage? Like, there's a whole bunch of them around, you know, cottages for rent near the marshes of Morva. Terrence, of course I didn't. Go look for yourself. They aren't the same. There are three of them, yes, but they're different. One... was carding wool. One was at the loom weaving. And one was spinning thread. That is, this one had wool in a basket and is carding it and is pulling strands out. This one is taking that wool, spinning thread into it. This one is taking the thread and making it into material. Back up for a moment because I've got a note that we need to use. Who are these three? These are the fates. These are the three fates in Greek mythology. Okay? You have... Clotho, the spinner, 
Lachesis, the measurer, and atropo, essentially the cutter. Okay? And in Greek mythology, what do they spin, measure, and cut? The threads of each individual's life. So, Clotho spins out the thread of your life. Lachesis says he gets this much, or this much, and Atropo goes, snip, and that's when you die. <clears throat> they keep talking, and Alanwi says, You're beautiful. Look at them. They're gorgeous. I've heard of hags trying to disguise themselves, says Fluter. I wonder who they are. Taryn, I don't know who they are. But I fear that they are more powerful than we could even guess. Somehow we've fallen on I, I, I don't know what. Okay? So, they try to take the cauldron, but they can't again. And they're caught. Chapter 14. Let's see here. Let's go to page 120. Terrence says, kill us, you evil hags. We would have stolen the cauldron, blah, 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 blah. Ordu says we're not evil, we're not neither good nor evil, we're simply interested in things as they are. Top of 121. Ailanwi says, you don't care, that's worse than being evil. Certainly we care, it's that we don't care in quite the same way you do, or maybe care isn't really the right word. Okay. And Ordu says, we've talked it over, you get the cauldron. What? You let us great. But she says, the croaking is useless, bottom of 121, except for making cauldron board. That's the only reason it exists. Rana spoiled it for anything else, as you might imagine. It's sad it should be so, but that's the way things are. The cauldron born are the last creatures in the world we went around here. We've decided the croaking is nothing but a bother to us. Since you're friends of Dolbin, you're giving it to us? Well, we never give anything. Only what is worth earning is worth having. We give you the opportunity to buy it. Only what is worth earning is worth having. Okay? You can't just be given, for example, respect. You have to earn it. Karen, we don't have any treasures. We don't have any money to buy this with. She goes, no, 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 no. Surely you can find something to offer in exchange. You know, the north wind in a bag. Yeah, how do you do that? Uh, impossible. Okay, then the south wind. Taryn, the price you ask is beyond what any of us can pay. Okay, so maybe you're right. So let's, let's make it more personal. Bottom of 122. I have it. Give us the nicest summer day you can remember. You can't say that's hard. It belongs to you. Where is it? It's inside. It's in his memory. Give us that memory, Taryn. How? Or any other day. They're, they're inside me somewhere. You can't get that out. I mean, well, we could try. And he's like, heck off you. We've made out suggestions. We're willing to listen to yours. That is, you know, we came partway in this negotiation. Now you come partway. Taryn, what can I give him? My sword, right? Book of Three began how? He's making horseshoes. He wants to make a sword. He wants a sword more than anything. Dalvin has given him a sword. It's pretty important. It's pretty valuable. Here, you can have my sword. Right? You can have the horse. That Avion gave me. Or you can have my own horse. We don't need horses. That's all I have. Gurgi says, um, 
Take my great treasure. Take my wallet of unending food. Nah, we don't need that. But it's all I have. So, Taryn has offered seemingly everything he has. Gurgi offers everything he has. Ilanwi, you must like jewelry. She pulls out her little bauble, her ball, or whatever it is. Take this. She offers everything she has. She goes, no, you might need that one day. She goes, well, I do have something else. That's what she gives them, or offers. Fluter says, take my harp. So notice, all four of them have now done what? They've offered everything they have. Except Taryn hasn't offered one thing yet. All right. And they say, okay, well, negotiation's over, I guess. We'll stop there. We'll pick up with 15. We'll finish this on Friday. Um, and have a quiz on this on Friday. I'll have your other quizzes. I just completely forgot about them. Um, graded for you then.